I'm here visiting with Peter Kukowski. He and his wife, Jesse, farm up in the Powell area. Peter, will you tell us a little bit about what your, um, what your basic crops you're growing and what your rotation is? Uh, barley, alfalfa seed, and then beets. And are you mostly pivot irrigated? No, it would be a, a split, probably, what you estimate, 60 percent flood, 40 percent uh, pivot sprinkler style irrigation. And it looks like you're doing some strip till, maybe some no-till on some of your fields. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Some of both. The strip till uh, has really trended towards like the beets. I've done dry beans with the strip till. Alfalfa seed, we've done some no-till, basically planting right into the barley stubble after grain harvest. Each field is, is, we try to manage it for what works the best for it. How long have you been using strip till? I think the first experiment with it was probably in 2008. Okay. And it's working for you pretty well, so it sounds like. Stuck with it. Stuck with it, yeah. Have you noticed any changes in your soil since you've switched over some of your fields to strip till? The permeability, we would plow and basically bury all organic matter. It, you'd get a rain and the, the soil would almost seal off, almost like glass as we've been able to leave more plant material on the surface intermingled. Uh, the water, the percolation is really, um, we don't seem to get the, the crusting or the sealing almost. Are you, do you find you're using less water or your water use has changed? Anytime you can, can increase your efficiency, whether it's through uh, the improvement of the infrastructure, uh, a sprinkler system, anything like that, if you're more efficient in the application of the water, the plant's ability to efficiently use it because he's not drowned out or droughted out right. at certain stages. Right. Right. Have you noticed much change in your soil organic matter or your nutrient management when you've changed over? If we get more data over a longer period, I think we'll see the, the trajectory will go up, but it seems in a twice a year soil sampling program, it's, yeah, well, it's hard to see. I think if we broaden the scope, it'll get better sure. over time. Soil testing will say, okay, how much do we need to put down with the strip till? Have we put some out there that is still available to provide a variety of, of different fertility? And you're using tissue testing on your beets specifically? Are you doing anything on your beets, alfalfa? barley. The alfalfa has consistently told me to apply boron <laughs> and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Uh, the alfalfa seed is a little different animal than a, a forage hay that would be planted at a, a high population. Mm -hmm. The amount of plants that you have to feed on an acre are significantly fewer. Right. So even low fertility in a field is miraculously enough to carry it. Um, you haven't seen any real obvious changes in your alfalfa that's been no-tilled into your barley stubble in terms of nutrient management there? It's been no, not really. Um, so many of our soil samples have, have indicated that we've almost banked or tied up uh, a lot of phosphate and potash over the years. Mm -hmm. And so the sulfur to maybe try and take some of that to a more available form mm -hmm. probably is, is, is meeting the need of the alfalfa. So you are doing some strip till into your flooded fields. Mm -hmm. To go in with a plow, roller, level better to basically reestablish what was originally there seemed kind of futile. The stubble provided some protection, but it's a double-edged sword because it's also a more of a passive yellow color in the spring, so the solar heating is a little bit less than when you turn the soil black. Originally, wherever there was a transition, basically an elevation change, the slope of the field, if it went with the rows, the, the strip till, it just washed right down through there. Where it presented itself that leaving more trash in that seed row was basically just the getting the machine adjusted. Oh, well, that row's kind of dirty. And then I noticed, well, that dirty row that left more material in there didn't wash. The really clean one that just looked perfect, just like you could just plant garden vegetables down, was the one that washed out on me. So are you grazing any of your fields? I am. Uh, we save, try to save all of the beet tops and pasture them. And then the barley stubble is reseeded with more barley. Uh, a 
very simplified operation of basically the harvester augers some grain into the fertilizer truck that has fertilizer that kind of mediocrely blends it up, dumps it in the spreader, spray it on and irrigate it to try and maximize the, uh, the AUMs. Can you tell me why you started strip tilling uh, initially? The concept had always seemed fairly logical um, because we'd go out and embed the barley ground and irrigate it. Why can't we just fracture right down the middle of that bed or that, you know, right next to that corrugation and plant our beet in there and place our fertilizer in there? So was, was erosion a big motivating factor or you, as well? Were you having erosion issues at that oh, point? Yeah. There's been erosion in this valley for a look around. I don't think it's a new thing. The ground that was plowed, rolled, leveled, the conventional tillage practice, especially if you just plowed, rolled, leveled in the fall, uh, it would blow. So you'd have wind erosion, then you'd bed it in the spring and plant beets, and then you'd have water erosion flushing out, you know, filling, you'd get a waste ditch full of sediment and silt, and all that was your topsoil there, and then the rocks were what were left in the field. Over time, that just seemed like a, a natural transition away from that. Uh, the highly erodible land designation through the NRCS, I mean, that was something that, as that became a bigger piece of the puzzle, and trying to achieve some of the goals that were set out by that, Conventional cash cropping operation of, of barley, beans, beets, whatever, you know, things that require a lot of tillage or had in the past really were a challenge to fit. And a lot of time spent walking plugged up water rows from straw thinking, how do I continue down this path but make it work? And it's also been a way to get some of the, the phosphate and the potash on with some sulfur. When you started to change over to some strip till or no till, were there some major equipment costs or costs oh, of yeah. changing? The biggest hurdle is most every farm is already equipped for whatever production practice they've, they've been using. It, it's not an all or nothing. It's not like, okay, well, the plow became the strip till machine for this growing season. No, it didn't. It's, it's the doubling up of uh, uh, conservation tillage tools as well as the conventional tillage tools. It's not a backbreaker by any stretch of the imagination. It's just something to think about. Initially I was able to hire the strip till and that was how I was able to dip my toe in without having to go out and, and purchase the machinery. Uh, then as he transitioned away from that I was comfortable with, okay I know what I'm looking for, I know what I want out of the machine and, and what I expect. So therefore I was able to, to kind of budget in, okay, these are the things I need, this is about what it's gonna cost. I'm still gonna have a mix of conservation and conventional tillage. Economics probably transition more than a lot of things. Just as the wallet gets lighter, people look at, ooh, you know, whether it's lighter because they have to pay more for labor so they need to be more efficient with that resource or else it's fuel or machine or whatever. Sure. What advice might you give to somebody else who is wanting to change a few practices like this on their place? I would ask what is your motivation for doing it? Is it forced, i.e. highly erodible land through the NRCS? Uh, is it a desire to build organic matter? Somebody usually has one that would rise you know, to the top of the, the list, but then there may be, oh, well, yeah, I'd like that and I'd like that. So it becomes a kind of like putting a puzzle together to get the right combination. Mm -hmm. You come to the Bighorn Basin, we have a lot of different seed crops, malt barley, beets, dry beans. As we continue forward, I don't think a monoculture of only corn or only sugar beets uh, is even, even applicable or only hay for our low organic matter desert soils. I think the variety that we have is, is probably helping us win some of the battle. Actually it was a quote I'd heard in California was uh, the harvest is getting this crop out of the way of the next one. The reason we can't have the next crop is because we have to get whatever's growing there out of the way now. It was almost the impediment of the next seeding. So many people harvest is the end of the race and to that guy it was 
harvest was just the first step of growing his next crop.